Greetings History 141 students, John Fia here back, Founding Fathers and Megan Piet behind the camera. Uh, if you see Megan around campus, you know, give her a pat on the back and she's just doing a great job this uh, semester uh, producing these films uh, and uh, um, hopefully we're going to move into next semester as well. By the way, uh, with the course wrapping up, if any of you have any suggestions, whether students or people watching this on the blog, uh, for new topics for the virtual office hours for the spring, I'm open to, uh, to listening to ideas. So feel free to send them my way uh, at jfea at messiah.edu, and hopefully we'll get that up on the screen for you. Um, we are still in this critical decade of the 1850s. Last lecture, we talked about the uh, can uh, Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the establishment of the Republican Party. In 1857, the Supreme Court gets into the mix. Uh, there's this uh, slave named Dred Scott. Dred Scott moves from a slave state, Missouri, into a free state, Illinois. I think he spent some time in Wisconsin territory as well. When his master dies, he returns to a slave state, which then raises the question, does a slave, when they move into a free state, cease being a slave? And thus, when they return to a slave state, you know, are they, are they a free black rather than a slave? This case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. It is here where Chief Justice Roger Tawney, a Southern sympathizer and a slaveholder himself, is going to write the decision. Tawney has remembered two things to, to decide. One, does a slave uh, have the right to sue in court? Now he could technically say no, and that would be the end of the case. But Tawney says, first of all, no, a slave cannot sue in court, because slaves are not citizens, they don't have the right to sue in court. But then he goes on and deals with the second question, even though he doesn't have to. This sort of plays into Tawney's kind of pride or ambition or, you know, sense of history. He wants to make this landmark decision on behalf of the Slave Society of the South. Uh, and he concludes that when, slaves are property, and as a result they can be taken into any state in the Union that they want because the government can't touch a person's property or chattel. Uh, essentially what this means is all of these debates that happened in the beginning of the decade, Kansas, Nebraska, uh, or even going back to the Missouri Compromise of 1820, slave versus free state, the Supreme Court now is basically saying that those things are irrelevant. You can bring your slave anywhere you want. So technically, if you read this, uh, this case, the decision on this case uh, carefully, you'll notice that it doesn't really matter. There are no slave or free states. Uh, you can because you can take your slave anywhere and that that human being will still be your slave uh, of course the Republican Party is outraged at this decision uh, Stephen Douglas and the Northern Democrats are probably a little bit embarrassed by it as well because this takes away the idea of popular sovereignty that the people have a choice whether or not they want their state or their territory to be slave or free uh, and it also uh, it, it certainly favors the South and the Southern Democrats uh, who now, you know, can expand slavery anywhere they want to expand it. So I think this is a, a decisive Supreme Court case. I mean, think about the way things are going. You know, the South has the Fugitive Slave Act. They can go into the North and bring their slaves back if they want. They have the Supreme Court now on their side. They have a president, a Northern Democrat president named uh, James Buchanan, who's really doing nothing to sort of stop the spread of slavery. Uh, they're in pretty good shape uh, in the 1850s late 1850s. We then moved ahead and talked a little bit about the Stephen Douglas, Abraham Lincoln debates for the Senate seat in Illinois. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, talking about the way both Douglas and Lincoln challenged one another in those debates. Go back and look at your notes. We don't have time to go into that. But Lincoln really, even though these debates drew attention because of Stephen Douglas, Lincoln really emerges as a national figure. Uh, as a result of these debates. Uh, and, and he's able to pin Douglas down on certain questions uh, about um, whether or not uh, there are slave states or free states, whether or not uh, people have the right to choose whether they're a slave or free state uh, in a territory, I should say, before it becomes a state. Um, again, go back and look at your notes. We spent a lot of time on articulating those fine points of the debate. We just don't have time to get into them here on the, on the film today. Um, of course, Douglas tries to pin Lincoln out, uh, present Lincoln as uh, a, a lover of blacks, 
uh, someone who wants to integrate blacks into white society. Uh, and he knows that this will be a scary proposition uh, to the people of Illinois. Douglas wins the, wins the Senate seat. Lincoln, however, uh, becomes a national figure. And then in 1860, uh, Lincoln is going to, to defeat Douglas. Lincoln running on the Republican ticket. Douglas running on the Northern Democrat ticket. Of course, John C. Breckinridge is going to be chosen by the Southern Democrats in the election of 1860, the presidential election. Uh, and then you have this guy named John Bell running for a party known as the Constitutional Union Party, which we talked a little bit about in class. But Lincoln will be elected, sort of a dark horse candidate, uh, a minority president in the sense that he only gets about 40% of the popular vote, which, it, which basically implies that 60% of the people in the United States do not want Abraham Lincoln to be president. He's on, on the ballot in a lot of southern states. Um, but this is the task now that Lincoln's going to face. Uh, he now has the task of holding the nation together. Uh, and as we're going to see in the last lecture, uh, he, uh, they're going to be, uh, uh, most of the states in the South are going to secede from the Union uh, shortly after his election. So this is the challenge that he's going to face. And in our last uh, lecture, which Professor Snyder is going to give, and which I'll talk about in a, in a later office hours, uh, Lincoln, uh, we're going to talk about the way Lincoln tries to keep the Union together, how he passes the Emancipation Proclamation to help him to do that, uh, and then um, you can even go further into the seminar when we talked about his second inaugural address and his, um, his desire to heal the wounds of the nation uh, in the wake of the Civil War. Uh, so again, we moved very, very quickly through the Civil War in this class. Um, you know, some of you who are more interested, we offer a Civil War class here in the History Department. You may want to sign up for that and take that. I think we'll even be offering it in the fall of uh, 2014. Um, but uh, uh, one more lecture to go. Uh, and again, our exam, Tuesday, December 17th, I would encourage you to actually go back and look at one of the previous office hours in which we talked about the best way to study for an exam. This will be the third exam, not comprehensive, but the third exam. So I'll see you at the exam. Uh, good luck, or may God providentially give you the grade that you deserve. Thanks for watching.